Hey all, my name is Joe Rendez. I'm a senior solutions architect at GitLab. I'm here to talk about securing your CI CD pipeline with OIDC to enable fine grained access to AWS. So if we uh, jump right into it, um, if we imagine this is a Tuesday afternoon, you have a billing app team reaching out um, and you're the DevSecOps team. Billing app team might say, hey, can you provision a pipeline that deploys to our new billing app onto our ECS cluster? DevOps team says, hey, do you need this on de development, staging, and production account? And they go, yep. And we also need to have the maintainers be able to only deploy that too. So you say, you respond back and say, hey, let me set up that AWS pipeline. We'll keep you posted. So at this point, you might think, well, um, I have an ECS template that can deploy out, but how am I going to create that connection between GitLab and AWS? So right now, you might be aware of two existing methods that exist to create that connection between the two. Um, one of those is using AWS access keys as mass variables, very efficient way. Um, advantages to this, very effective for a small number of applications, uh, efficient for proof of concepts, and there's a lot of mapping flexibility between the pipeline and branch level. Um, in terms of disadvantages, you have manual rotation of keys, which requires more effort on the DevOps team, um, which also puts you at risk of credential exposure. Uh, the second option is applying the role to the compute of the GitLab runner. Um, this inherently gives you an embedded role permission. So you have your deployment job, whatever that role is, you can now push out to any of those services. Uh, at this point too, is you can use GitLab runner tags to um, route where those deployments go based on the account. Um, as dedicated um, routing mechanism. Um, disadvantages of this is it, this can lead to excess compute resources due to environment isolation. Um, as a result, this will increase your cost just to have the deployment runner out there. Um, you also risk of um, overprivileging those runners as well. Um, so as of 15.9 or February, there's been a release of the OpenID Connector JWT token that is in production, which you can now leverage to create that connection between GitLab and AWS. So before I jump in, um, for those who might not be aware of OpenID Connect in terms of the CI CD sense, um, let's look at this in layman's terms. So if we imagine we're walking into a speakeasy, if we look at the bottom right here, and there is a Coca-Cola fridge that you want to walk into and there's a bar behind it, from the doorman perspective, they're going to go ahead and establish that list of names that they trust who can come in. The party goer, they receive an invite, they want to go, so they do find this fridge. They open up the window, they walk up to the fridge and talk into the speaker box. Doorman goes and says, hey, let's uh, get your name and passcode. Um, party goer, share your ID with your secret and passcode back to the doorman. Um, the doorman checks the ID along with that secret and passcode. Bridge opens, you can now enjoy the party. Uh, putting this into a bit more of a, a specification, if we look at the provider, this being the doorman, they're going to go ahead and define the identity, the audience, and the claims. Identity being who the client might be. Audience, these are uh, going to be what you're targeting from the client side. Claims are going to be the resources based off what's defined on the client. Um, from the client side, they're going to go ahead and send the JWT token with embedded claims. So from a GitLab perspective, this might be your group, project, environment name, branch name, any of the resources that might be associated um, in that. Um, from the provider side, it's going to go ahead and decode and verify that JWT with a public key return that result or temporary key back to the client. And then the client can now perform any operations based off that permissions. All right, so now taking this a step further and looking at how this workflow works between GitLab and AWS. So from the AWS side, we're gonna go ahead and create an identity provider using OpenID Connect. Um, there's also gonna be an audience defined, which we'll uh, show later that we need to uh, explicitly define on the GitLab side, but this is gonna be who you're targeting from the client. Um, and then on the, Role, this is the most important part. So that role is going to have a policy, or there's going to be a policy attached to the role, but there's going to be conditionals defined on that role. Um, so you'll be assuming a role with this. And in those conditions, it's going to define which group, project, or branch has access to those AWS resources. Now on GitLab, there's going to be a JWT, JWT or JOT token that you can opt in on the CI CD job. Um, this is going to be injected in. Um, you'll be using STS and assuming a role um, within this point. And then you're going to be taking the resource name that you were given when you created the role in the previous step and injecting that into your call. And you'll be also applying the audience, which must match the audience that you defined when you created your identity provider. So at this point, you'll call a security token service with your JOT token. And then 
you will verify, or the AWS side will verify the JAT token. So it's going to decode it with the public key that's on the GitLab side, to val validate the audience specified, check the conditionals, and then it'll generate the credentials. Everything passes. Um, it'll return those temporary keys. And then at this point in your CI job, um, you can virtually call any service call that security token service supports. This might be retrieving secrets or deploying out to any AWS service. All right, so looking at a, a basic example here, if we look at the right, I have a production account set up. We look at the dotted line. Um, I have my OpenID Connect provider, I have a policy, and then that policy is going to be attached to the role. On the left, I have a GitLab group um, project. Um, in this particular example, we have a CI variable with a prod resource name. This is that resource name that was generated when I created the role. That's going to be mapped into, in this case, a branch in this the main branch. Um, if we look a little further in this JOT token on the bottom left, um, the three values that are important to look at for the JOT token with AWS is your issuer. This is either going to be GitLab.com or your self-managed insta um, instance, the audience value, which you specify in the CI job, and then your subject value. This is uh, automatically defined from GitLab um, as of today. So this is going to be your group, your project, and your branch name. And then if we look at the role um, on the AWS side, um, so we're assuming the role with web identity, um, we have conditions that have been set up here. So this is going to be the subject line that we're validating against. So this is saying, hey, um, these res or this GitLab project has access to these specific resources for whichever policies attached to there. And we can look at a basic example here. This is, um, if we look at the ID tokens attribute, that's how you're opting in for the JWT token job. Um, so we're going to define the JOT token as my OIDC token. We're specifying the audience value, which will be validated on the AWS side. And the before script, there's a little bit of magic happening here, but AWS is going to call security token service on behalf of us. So we're going to copy the ID token into a web identity file, specify the uh, named profile. So in this case, OIDC. And then there is a role resource name that we um, are passing in as well. Then in the process of the script, we now have the credentials to perform any uh, call into AWS based off that um, STS temporary credential that we, we received. Uh, now you might be wondering, right, what are the granular controls that we can use with conditional mapping? Um, so you can do anything by branch. So if you look at the bolds, um, main branch, you can point to a particular branch if you have like dev or production. Um, you can do any branch by using a wildcard. Um, you can specify by project. Um, you can do any project in a group, again, using wildcard. This might be helpful if you have um, a team that's using all the same resources and you just want to map the same privileges um, under that all the applications in that group. Um, you can also point to uh, the Git tag as well. Um, here's another example. So this is using a multi-account deployment with ECS. So I have a development and a staging account set up here. Um, uh, ma branch, branch mapping using the role variable. So if we look at the CI variable on the left within the project, I have a role resource name that's mapped to that branch and then a prod resource name mapped to that branch. That's going to help me route between each of those accounts there. And again, looking at the JOT token at the bottom left, we do have um, production within the subject value. And then if we look at the AWS role on the right, we can see that we're adding a condition for that production there. Um, this example is in Guided Explorations. Um, group, but if you want to take a look, um, I have a few things I wanted to show off here. Um, in the CI CD variables for this multi-account setup, I have, um, for my dev account, I have a role resource name defined, and then I have a prod resource, resource name defined. And then if I go into my pipeline, I have an AWS prep setup. So this is going to do the magic of calling security token service on behalf of me. Um, this will do it for each of the jobs. So for ECR, I have this um, running to work. So see that I'm doing the credential call here. And then also similarly for ECS. So um, I'll declare the ID tokens. This is what's passed into the web identity file and my AWS prep, my function here. Um, and any function calls afterwards, if everything passes, I can now perform my ECS calls, um, which was defined in the policies. Um, bringing this full circle, um, if we want to visualize multi-account deployments with all the controls that you have within GitLab, um, if we could imagine that we have a development uh, deployment pushing out to ECR, 
retrieving secrets from AWS Secrets Manager and then deploying to ECS. Um, you might repeat this process um, for staging and production. The one thing I wanna show on the right here is I'm using again that scope CI variable, the resource name that was given when I created that role um, for each of those accounts. So for my development account, I have my resource name tied to that, staging tied to my resource name tied to staging, production again tied to that. And then if you need controls um, when you're deploying out or promoting between each of the environments, merge approvals is the, the simplest approach. Um, you can uh, set up your senior approvers or your, your SREs to approve those deployments. Um, you can also set up protected environments. So if you have an environment set up in your CI job, you can um, tag those, those environments there. You can take those protected environments a step further and determine who can deploy out based off users, groups, or permissions. Um, so just a wrap up of all the controls um, along with OIDC within your pipeline. Um, so, so wrapping this up here, um, again, we were tasked with creating an ECS pipeline and then creating connection with uh, between GitLab and AWS. Um, now we want to visualize those trade-offs. So we mentioned the two, we had the mask variables and applying the role to the runner. There's now that third option using that JOT token. So this next, um, Slide here, we'll visualize the trade-offs between three, I credit Darwin Snowy on creating this. Um, so if we look at the three flags at the top, we have assigned compute keys and OIDC. So looking at it from a mapping flexibility, um, assigning compute um, is gonna be a little less flexible, whereas the OIDC is gonna be just scripted to just the job where you have flexibility to your branches, your environment names, and so on. Um, with assigning to the compute, you're gonna have runner sprawl. You might be creating runners just to deploy out to an environment. Um, again, this could be cost intensive, whereas OIDC is scriptive to the job itself. Uh, looking at the complexity from an uh, administrative perspective, depending on your implementation, OIDC might have a lot more overhead with that, whereas assigning compute is sort of invisible and just within the runner itself. Um, developer perspective might be not as familiar with OIDC within the pipeline, so this might cause a little confusion there, there whereas the keys or the, the compute might be a little more um, familiar with them. Um, again, with complexity um, from architecture engineering that might be more based off the implementation with JWTs where the keys, not so much. Um, and then security level uh, with keys, you're at risk of credential exposure um, due to the inherent nature of them not being able to be rotated, whereas OIDC, um, less exposure, and you're also getting um, temporary credentials for at least uh, or at most an hour that you can specify. So um, better security in that regard. Um, also, some resources, again, you can check out the GitLab documentation on connecting either with GCP Azure, Vault, or AWS. Um, there's a couple of tutorials out there. Also, make note as of 16.5, there's a deprecation of the, the old uh, job job variables, and now we're uh, using this in favor of using the ID tokens in your CI job. Uh, that's it for this uh, presentation. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out. Um, you can uh, reach out to your account manager and ask questions, and we can support you in that effort. Or if you want to leave comments on here, happy to support uh, asynchronously. Thank you all for joining us.